Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Renfrew Center Foundation's webinar, Powering Up for Eating Disorder Awareness Week. My name is Hannah Podhorzer, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm a member of our alumni services team, and I will be your moderator for today's online presentation. Before I introduce you all to today's presenter, Erin Priorly, I wanted to go over a few announcements to give others some extra time to join in. First off, we are very excited to let you all know that most of our sites have returned to in-person services. If you visit our website, renfrewcenter.com, you'll be able to find a list there of the exact sites offering in-person programming. We still continue to offer our virtual programming called Run for at Home across the country as well. Now for some alumni resources. So as this presentation suggests, next week is Eating Disorders Awareness Week. Eat a Week is an annual campaign dedicated to public awareness, education, and hope for individuals and families affected by eating disorders. Eat a Week will take place next week from Monday, February 27th to Sunday, March 5th. Renfrew's theme this year is We've Got the Power. Our campaign is a call to action to reject diet culture messages, find power and vulnerability, and give full permission to celebrate and live fully in your body. Renfrew will be hosting many virtual events for alumni and community members, including art and movement groups and workshops related to social media, college, and advocacy. You can see more on this slide here. For more information or to register for any of our offerings for Eat a Week, you can visit renfrewcenter.com slash we've got the power. Now, as we head into the spring, we've also got some exciting webinars planned. Next month, we'll be hearing from Megan Brown, Regional Admissions Team Lead at the Renfrew Center of Boston. She will be talking with us about grieving the promises of diet culture and recovery on Wednesday, March 29th. After that, we'll hear from Chelsea Dorita, primary therapist and alumni representative at the Renfrew Center of Charlotte, who will be sharing a webinar called From Self-Criticism to Self-Compassion in Eating Disorder Recovery. And that'll be on Wednesday, April 19th. Then we'll hear from Ashley Moser, clinical education specialist at the Renfrew Center, as she presents, Do I Have to Love Myself First? Exploring Romantic Relationships in the Context of Eating Disorders. And that'll be on Wednesday, May 3rd. We're also still hosting our residential alumni support group monthly with our next meeting scheduled for Tuesday, March 14th. We're also continuing to host weekly BIPOC and SAGE outpatient groups if you're looking for more specific support related to your life and recovery. You can reach out on our phone number if you're interested in learning more about these groups and register for any of those aforementioned events that interest you at runfreecenter.com slash events. And as always, if you feel like you need more support at this time or in the future, please call 1-800-RENFREW if you're interested in learning more. Now to get on to the reason you are all here, which is the webinar. So following the webinar, we would love your feedback. You will receive an evaluation form from us via email to be completed online. And that evaluation form will help us develop new and innovative programs that will assist you in your recovery. A question and answer session will also follow the presentation this afternoon. Questions can be submitted at any time during the webinar by typing them either into the chat or the Q&A function. Please make sure you're sending the chat to all panelists and not everyone so that your question will just be visible to us. I would now like to introduce you all to today's presenter who perhaps needs no introduction in the alumni services world of Renfrew, but I'd still love to introduce her anyway. So Erin Byerly, licensed clinical professional counselor, started working as the team leader of the Renfrew Center of Baltimore in September 2016 and joined the alumni services team in 2019 as the alumni services coordinator. Prior to joining Renfrew, Erin had worked in private practice as well as inpatient, partial, and intensive outpatient levels of care. Erin has worked in the field of eating disorder treatment since receiving her master's degree in 2012. She enjoys working with people to make positive and long-lasting changes in life through therapy and building their emotional tolerance. So without further ado, Erin, I'm going to pass the proverbial Zoom microphone over to you. Thank you very much, Hannah. Um, thank you so much for having me to, to here today. And this is so different for me. I am really excited to be on the other side um, presenting today. So little background, we're going to start just kind of with a little bit of introduction to this idea of power. Um, what is power? Who has it? How can we um, use our power? What can it do? And how do we remember our power? 
So like Hannah already said, next week marks the beginning of Eating Disorders Awareness Week. And um, if you've, you know, been following Renfrew along for, you know, a few years, you've noticed that we like to develop a theme to promote um, to our alumni and our supporters in addition to the National Eating Disorders Association's theme. Um, and we really feel like it's an important week for recognizing advocacy and awareness. And this year, the theme revolves around the idea of recognizing the power each of us has within ourselves. It's an important thing to remember because for many of us, we're going to be part of a marginalized population. This means we don't feel as though we have the same power as others. When we're part of a marginalized group, it means we're kind of pushed to the side and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And we live in a world with societal pressures to live a certain way, to look a certain way. And we're told by people who appear to be in power or have more power than us that there is a right way to eat, to dress, to feel, basically just to behave. So what we hope to do this year is highlight that those pressures and those people we perceive as like being the ones that have the power don't always or they at least don't always need to be listened to, and that there is power in allowing ourselves to be uniquely us, that imperfect, imperfection, mistakes, all of it allows us to really be seen, be who we are. So, so throughout the webinar, we are going to be discussing our individual power, how to harness it, and kind of what it all means. So let's start with the basics. If we're going to be spending 45 minutes talking about power, let's uh, let's make sure we know what it is. So for a lot of us, when we think about power and when I search for images of power, the first thing that comes up is like the power button on our phone or laptop, maybe even your car. Um, but that isn't the power we're going to be talking about here today. In the simplest form of the definition of power, it's an ability to act or produce an effect. It could also be possession of control, authority, or influence over others. This is when it's used as a noun. When it's used as a verb, it's defined as giving impetus to. So basically saying that it is a force to make something happen. So when we think about power in our lives, it really is all around us and not just in the buttons. Each time we make a decision to act or not to act, that is an expression of our power. And we're producing an effect um, by recognizing that power and simply being in it. If any of you have been at Renfrew um, and in a group recently, you know that we start almost all of our groups with a check-in that usually asks you to reflect on what you're bringing into the group and how will that land with the group. It's this this idea, this idea of landing is this therapeutic and indirect way of asking you to reflect on how your power um, by simply being present in the group will impact other people. Having you all be present for this, in this webinar is impacting me and the emotions that I'm experiencing and, and the experience I'm having. So the power that you all exerted in choosing to be here, in choosing to be present, is going to have an impact not only on you, but on myself as well and the other people here. And it's a pretty cool, be it somewhat uncomfortable realization to have sometimes that simply by being and existing, we are noticing and using power. We are producing an effect. We are having an impact. We are giving impetus to things. Um, the reason though we need webinars like this and check-in questions like Renfrew has around landing is because oftentimes in life, we might feel like our power isn't being recognized or acknowledged. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Okay, so who does have the power? Um, well, if you ask me, it's everyone. Um, and I'm also aware that in reality, that is not what we're always faced with in our day-to-day -day lives. Instead, we might feel like these are the people that have the power. So 
we can't talk about power in our society and our culture without acknowledging that we live in a patriarchal society. And I also can't give this presentation without acknowledging the power and privilege I have as a straight cis white woman who is employed. So when we think about power in our society, these were the ideas that came to my mind. And I realize it is likely not all inclusive and you all could add in your own images and ideas. Um, so please do not take this as an extensive list. But some of the things that came up for me were male, cisgendered, well-educated, able-bodied, white, heterosexual, white collar jobs, and employed, attractive, well-liked, a slim or athletic body, and rich are the adjectives that kind of came up when I think about someone with power. It does not mean that these are the only people that can have power or do have power. And as we've been discussing, we each have a power and yet the society we live in often only promotes one or a few of these ideas leading to someone having more power. So this leads us to forget that while these other people may have power in a different way than we do, it does not diminish the power we have in our lives. So where does that leave the rest of us? Um, if we're not kind of falling into one of these categories, then where are the rest of us? So in one way or another, most of us belong to what is called a marginalized group at some point in time or in some instance or in some experience. To be marginalized means we are treated as insignificant or peripheral. We experience this on large scales within like cultural contexts when certain rights or advantages are given to some people, but not others. So common examples of marginalized groups are the BIPOC community, LGBTQ plus communities, um, then also women, anyone less educated, low, lower socioeconomic statuses. And on smaller scales, we may feel marginalized within our work culture, maybe our family culture or our social relationships. This idea of feeling um, othered or treated as insignificant. So the problem with having these marginalized groups on both big and large scales, other than it just you know being unfair, is that we live in a culture that talks a lot about and kind of gives a lot of like lip service to the importance of relationships between people, but then in reality ends up rewarding people for individualistic competitive efforts of kind of achieving over someone else and not worrying about that relationship as much. Um, in this like larger Western culture, we tend to kind of talk down to or denigrate anything that suggests dependency or a need for other people. This kind of cultural context leads to marginalized groups frequently having to carry and be responsible for the work of relationships, but then simultaneously disparaged for being interested only in relationships rather than like the more important channels of success, those individualistic ideas. So this not only robs people of potential opportunities, but it can also increase feelings of low self-esteem when they find themselves comparing to those who are chasing those like individual competitive efforts versus like, hold on, I'm over here like taking care of this relationship and not succeeding in that way. Am I doing something wrong? So with all of this kind of being said and recognizing that culturally we live in a world that does, um, promote more of that individualistic frame, there are ways that we can start to shift that and even use our power to help create new cultural norms. So um, this graphic comes from Jean Baker Miller and the Stone Center and it is used in their work with relational cultural theory. So relational cultural theory revolves around the idea that relationships are central to our survival as a species and are, are a biological imperative and not just something to consider as a second thought. So I, I want to make sure we're clear about that, that relationships are a biological imperative. 
we can't survive without them. And that old individualistic frame that's up there leads to people not doing as well because we're social creatures and we need those relationships. So, like I said, this theory believes we need relationships the same way we need food and water to survive and that the individualistic frame has developed as a social idea and is not the natural state for us as humans. So this idea that this has come about because of societal ideas, pressures, things like that, versus naturally, we are designed to be cohesive a relationship together. So when we shift from this socially constructed frame of individualism to the more like natural relational frame, we can see that many of the things we may feel lacking or looked down on because of are actually places where we are embracing our power. And it is with a shift in our thinking that we can start to tap into and recognize the power we have inherently within us all. So thinking about, you know, in an individualistic frame, knowing the power of like coming together and like working together, that idea of mutual empowerment on the relational side. In the individualistic frame, it's looked at as, well, you're not autonomous. Like you need other people. You can't do it on your own. You're not independent. And using our emotions as information about the relationship isn't looked at as like, oh, I'm like getting in touch with what I'm feeling and what other people are feeling. It is instead looked at as like, whoa, you're really overly emotional. This is not really working. So this idea that we are working to shift ourselves kind of back, almost like thinking of it as like a reset button, back to that more natural relational framework where it's recognizing that we do care about our impact on others. We do recognize that power we have and that we want to be aware of how we might be impacting others and that we know the importance of needing others and that having people in our circle that can be supports is actually a, a huge strength and having that strength and power to ask for help. That we're aware of and responsive to not only our feelings, but other people's feelings, and that we're able to be empathic with others. So what I want you guys to think about right now is a time this week when you judged yourself maybe for not following that individualistic frame we've got on the one side and what that situation was. And kind of thinking about looking at these two frames how would that behavior have been viewed from that more relational framework? You know, was there a time that it's like, ah, no, like my boss was having a really bad day. I didn't feel like it was the right time to go up and like ask them um, or like let them know this big news. Oh, well, you're afraid of confrontation. Like you should have done this. Or was it that you were caring about the impact on someone else? And just kind of taking a minute to think about that. I think it can be really cool to notice how it might feel different when we reflect on these experiences through like the more relational frame versus this individualistic frame. So nothing has to actually change in our experience. It really can just be that we start to shift the framework that we're looking at things in. So why is power important? Um, you know, we're kind of talking about this idea of power and what it is and all of that, and that it's not just power buttons, but like, why? Why does it matter? Um, so we each have encountered a time when there has been a power differential in a relationship we're a part of. This is just like a natural thing. They are normal. They are natural. It could have been when we were kids and um, it was with our parents or a teacher or some other adult. It could be in our workplace with a boss or a supervisor. Um, in the in themselves, in and of themselves, power differences, power differences. I can't talk today, guys. <laughs> are not a bad thing. And oftentimes they are necessary to actually provide training and growth. They do become harmful though, when the less powerful person cannot give voice to their feelings or is not responded to. In these instances, the less powerful person in the relationship will learn they have no impact on the other person or the relationship 
And this will lead to what's called chronic disconnection. And what chronic disconnection is, is it, it's really the source of suffering and psychological consequences. In the state of chronic disconnection, people learn that they cannot represent themselves fully or authentically in a relationship. They develop strategies of disconnecting from the relationship, people, things like that. Um, and they use these strategies of disconnections as a way to keep themselves safe. These strategies that people use to limit their sense of vulnerability by taking them out of the relationship out of connection. And because we're members of a marginalized population in one area or another, at one point in time or another, we're more likely to encounter these experiences um, of power differentials and then maybe not being the most helpful kind, the most natural kind. In our individualistically centered culture, we're not always likely receiving responses that let us feel heard, understood, and like we can impact the relationship, which is the definition of power. If chronic disconnection persists, people also often move into what Jean Baker Miller calls condemned isolation. So condemned isolation in this state, people feel cut off from others that they cannot represent themselves authentically. They hide parts of themselves out of a sense of fear, um, out of a sense of shame, usually having to do with their needs and their vulnerability. So feeling shame for having a need or feeling fear about being vulnerable. And it isolates the individual from real relationships and good connection. And a, a, a common outcome of chronic disconnection, like when this continues and it's really not kind of um, worked on, is that the individual ends up feeling increased shame, self-blame. They feel unable to act, unable to move. Um, and it develops this like belief that I am the problem. And in its essence, what it's really doing is robbing us of our sense of power and our belief in our power to be able to impact the world and those around us. So it's important for us to be talking about power because if we don't, we're not gonna recognize these ways that we might be losing power. Okay. So I am the problem. This belief that can develop over time with condemned isolation with those increased feelings of powerlessness, with the disconnection from relationships, with feeling like we can't be genuine or authentic, we may turn to ways to try and change ourselves, to try and create a sense of acceptance and connection. Like we said, we all need connection. We have to have connection as human beings. And when we start to switch and not feel connected, not feel heard, not feel able to authentically be vulnerable with someone, then we figure out ways to feel at least some form of connection, even if it isn't genuine. So we might try to change ourselves and find ways that we feel accepted. So we've got a few on here, dressing alike, posing certain ways, eating disorder behaviors. It's always code switching. It's always this idea of trying to fit the expectation we feel that those in power have over us or those that have power over us have over us. It's something we all experience at different times because again, we're yearning for a connection. It's to what extent that we've been hurt in relationships in the past, either by direct actions or by not responding, um, to, that we develop these strategies of disconnection. And they are in an, um, they are strategies we use to protect ourselves from the vulnerability of yearning for connection in an unresponsive relationship. And eating disorders themselves are disorders of disconnection. They are a strategy of disconnection. 
it keeps us from being in touch with ourselves. It teaches, it keeps us from being in touch with um, our body. It keeps us from being in touch and connected with others. And it doesn't allow us to be authentic, genuine, and vulnerable. It perpetuates that feeling of powerlessness we feel. And we feel like we don't have the ability to impact the other person or person while being our authentic self. The only way I can maybe impact this person is if I meet their expectations or if I'm like them um, in these different ways. So when we have all of that, it makes sense that we're going to develop strategies. And I'm sure we can all think of relationships we've been in where we feel unable to access our true power because we felt we had to fit into a role or a mold in that relationship. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about how that comes up and how we neglect our power. So we all have times that we've, you know, neglected our power where there hasn't been that ability to kind of tap into it and really use it. When we've experienced chronic disconnection and we haven't been able um, to have experiences that really reinforce the idea that we can be um, impactful, we can give impetus to something, then we are going to develop these strategies that neglect our power. So to start, we may have found ourselves in relationships that don't promote authenticity and mutuality. Mutuality is this idea that promotes re mutual respect in a relationship, um, sharing, feeling, being part of the growing connection, and being able to take an, an initiative. So without these ideas, the foundation of relationship, we may find ourselves like staying quiet. We may find that we believe it can't change. So staying quiet means that we are not speaking up. We're not saying what we truly feel or need. It takes away our power to impact the relationship and affect the relationship and the people taking part in it. Over time, if we are continually dismissed, maybe when we don't stay quiet and we do speak up, it's going to reinforce this idea that it can't change. At its core, believing something can't change, that we can't impact it, is that loss of power. It's that neglect of power. And resigning ourselves to that idea, we can't create change, whether it's in relationship or um, in our society on a larger scale, it neglects that power that we all hold within us. We might also be neglecting our power by <clears throat> continuing, to, continuing to support what takes our power. So organizations, situations, companies, things like that, um, that you know, are kind of built on taking power from marginalized people. By giving energy or money um, to people and institutions that take our power, we neglect to recognize that we have the power to motivate these institutions to change. And additionally, staying in situations or relationships that aren't recognizing our power um, is going to neglect our power. It's going to reinforce that belief. Staying in those situations will increase the likelihood that we will have more interactions that dismiss our power and our attempts to connect authentically, leading to increased evidence for the belief that things can't change and it continues this cycle of neglecting. So, an important side note, there are some hierarchical or like role relationships that are clearly defined as non-mutual um, and that they are intentionally do not provide um, and don't even like really invite mutuality or authentic representation. Um, and it, th that's okay. Like we said at the beginning, they're not inherently bad. It's learning how to differentiate when are we neglecting our power and like not letting that be seen. And when are we in one of these relationships or situations? Um, and we will discuss that as we move forward. So what happens when I don't acknowledge my power? You know, we've talked about all of these things going on, but okay, so what? So the reason it's so important for us to recognize our power and be able to kind of acknowledge it and tap into it is that there are some consequences to not acknowledging it. So 
first, it contributes to low self-esteem. So self-esteem, I always like to kind of define as our belief in our ability to handle difficulties, stressors, challenges, struggles in life, um, both with or without asking for support. So overall, like, how do I feel if something gets thrown at me? Do I feel able to handle it? Um, depending on how well I feel I'll be able to handle it, that'll give me a good gauge of where somebody's self-esteem is. So when we feel generally able to handle things we face in life, the challenges we face in life, either by ourselves or by asking for support, we feel capable and this improves self-esteem. When we have that belief that things can't change, we can't impact things, we may feel like we're always being faced with challenges we can't handle. And additionally, without that authentic connection to people, we will feel less able to ask for help and to have our needs met, leading to feeling less able to handle stressors. Because at some point in life, we all need to um, have other people support us to get through a challenge or a stressor. Continually having these experiences contributes to the development and growth of low self-esteem, and it kind of keeps itself in a cycle. The low self-esteem can then also lead us to feel the need to hide our authentic self, again, leading to neglecting our power. So you really see how things kind of cycle together. Um, another way not acknowledging our power can impact us is it increases our likelihood that we're going to engage in some emotional avoidance. Um, for anyone who has gone through Renfrew treatment in the last like seven, eight years, you will remember that we are all about decreasing emotional avoidance. Um, and our philosophy in treatment is that um, we have emotions and they are playing an important function and role in our lives and they need to be experienced in order to be able to act accordingly. And when we engage in emotional avoidance, we're actually missing out on valuable information our body is trying to tell us um, about the situation we find ourselves in. So it would you know, it's a deer not listening to um, the urge to run because there's a rustling in a bush and being like, oh my God, don't be so scared. Like, it's fine. No, like that information is there for a reason and it's meant to help. So emotional avoidance leads us to not being present or fully experiencing the situations or emotions that we find ourselves in, which is also one of the things that is going to lead to less connection. Um, and so we really want to recognize that not acknowledging our power is going to increase that emotional avoidance. So the emotions are likely to resurface at a different point in time. Um, so making sure we're, we're paying attention to them is gonna be an important part. The last way that um, this cycle kind of comes together is that it leads to this feeling of chronic disconnection. So like I said, lower self-esteem, we feel less able to be genuine and authentic, increased emotional avoidance leading to um, less connection with other people because we're not fully present and then we're not genuine and authentic. And then this chronic disconnection occurs. Um, like I said, it is when the less powerful person feels like they can't be heard, they're not listened to, they can't impact. Um, and when we aren't acknowledging our power, we are less likely to give voice to our feelings. We're more likely to hide or subvert our needs. And we're more likely um, to feel like we aren't being responded to because we're not speaking up, we're being quiet, we're not asking um, for what we need. And we feel less likely to impact the person because we're not being genuine and authentic. And again, it keeps this cycle kind of going. So let's talk about why we want to embrace our power. So why do I wanna have you all embrace your power? Well, to start, <laughs> embracing our power can reverse some of the side effects well, side effects we just talked about. Um, by embracing our power and allowing ourselves to be authentic and genuine in our relationships, we have the power um, to really recognize our power and have it be honored um, and can begin to experience higher self-esteem. So the way this works is we, by recognizing our power, embracing our power, we feel more capable to ask for our needs to be met 
which means we feel more comfortable taking on challenges and facing stressors and knowing that we have relationships that will be supportive if we need them. So this idea that by being more authentic, being more genuine, we have stronger connections, which means we have more people that we feel our supports, which means we feel more capable to handle stressors than we do handle more stressors. And then we feel more capable to handle more stressors and that cycle starts going in a different direction. Um, so we feel that sense of capability, that sense of power. And we'll also notice as we begin to embrace our power that we have less of a sense of pressure from the world and societies and cultures around us. So embracing our own power gives us a sense that we can create change in societies and cultures we're a part of, which reduces the pressure to conform to the norms that don't fit our values. So we end up living this more value-driven life that allow that we feel able to do because we don't feel the need to conform. We feel like our genuine authentic self can be okay and that that's okay. And this leads into this freedom to feel. So we stop looking to others to figure out, well, how am I supposed to feel in this situation? And instead can say for ourselves that, look, whatever it is I'm feeling, it makes sense for me. It might not be what other people are feeling, but it makes sense for me. And having this freedom allows us to stop using those emotion avoidance strategies. A lot of times they're eating disorder strategies um, and or eating disorder behaviors and any other behaviors that aren't in line with our values and decreases um, the, the feeling like that's the only way we can get through. They're no longer serving a purpose for us. So we become not only more aware of our power, but we're also able to be more authentic with ourselves leading to more genuine and supportive connections and relationships, leading to a decreased sense of pressure, re leading to a freedom to feel our emotion that allows us to be genuine and authentic. So it, again, it's that cycle. Okay, so <clears throat> we're talking about recognizing, embracing our power might sound good in theory, but you might be wondering, okay, but how do I do this? So it's an interesting process because practicing the skills that will help us acknowledge our power um, are actually the skills that we're like embracing. So it's, it's again, it's this cycle. Um, it has kind of exponential returns to it. So anytime you're practicing one thing, it's basically doubling. So the first thing that I think can be helpful is acknowledging our power um, is, or the first thing that can be helpful in acknowledging our power is to get to know our emotions and ourselves. So this can sometimes be the hardest step because it does require significant vulnerability. It means we have to be honest with ourselves about who we really are, what matters to us, what we value, what we want to be working towards outside of others' expectations or ideas. And we often create ideas of who we are and what matters to us and our values from the experiences we've had and the people around us. So it's kind of Const, it's kind of taking a step back from, you know, those experiences we have as kids saying like, oh, you're the, you're a good student, you're so smart and being like, okay, that's my belief that like, I've integrated that into who I am, but instead shifting um, to well, what do I really feel are my beliefs about myself and who do I really feel like I am? So Hopefully through work in treatment and in therapy, most people have started looking at like what has formed your beliefs and ideas and started looking at like which ones line up with who you want to be in the future um, and who you don't maybe want to be in the future. So um, we work also on this idea of embracing what makes you, you. So what are the things that make you uniquely you? What are the things that are genuine and authentic and specific to you? We build relationships that support power. So this idea that when we know ourselves, we're genuine, authentic, we are embracing ourselves, um, or embracing what makes us us, we end up creating more relationships that are connected, genuine, authentic, and that support our power. And 
again, like I said, it's the cycle. They're all playing together. When we start supporting other people's power, it forces us to acknowledge our own power, or encourages us to acknowledge our own power, and encourages us to embrace what makes us us, to get to know our emotions, to get to know ourselves, to build these relationships. So I think these are some ways we can start to acknowledge our power. Um, and what can change when I notice this? So we've talked a little bit about some of the pieces that can change, but the big thing, um, are these kinds of four areas that can change. So we've got our little graphic and what it is is that when we notice increased connection, um, the increased connection with others or increased connection with our authentic self, we have these, um, these five good things that happen. So Jean Baker Miller came up with this, but when we start at increased connection, we notice five five good things, increased zest, increased desire and ability to act, increased knowledge of self and other, increased sense of worth, and a desire for more connection. That increase we feel in genuine connection leads to an increase in our ability to act and our desire to act. This is another expression of power in life. By using that power to advocate for our needs, we're again reinforcing the idea that we matter and that our needs are deserving of being met um, as all peoples are. And when we advocate for our needs, it allows us the chance to see if our power is being recognized or not in a specific rela relationship. And we know that not all situations and relationships will recognize our power, especially when we are part of a marginalized group. What this will help us with though, even when our power isn't recognized and our needs not met, is in directing us away from relationships and situations that aren't serving us and towards relationships and situations that do recognize our power. So we end up being directed towards more meaningful connections with people who support our power and we support theirs, leading to increased feelings of connection and so the cycle goes. So what we will, do next is kind of explore our power and I'm checking our time because I want to make sure we get through everything. So we'll do this kind of quickly and then I want you guys to expand on this on your own afterwards, but grab a pen or paper, um, open up the notes app on your iPhone, whatever it might be, but we're going to do just a quick um, kind of reflection to get in touch with our power because we've kind of gone through all of these great ways we can use or we can notice our power and the good things that can happen from noticing our power, but Let's actually get in touch with our own. So we're going to make two lists. Um, and for the first, I want you to write down the times you have felt or used your power that you can think of. So they might not have been times that you recognized it as power in the moment, but looking back, you can see it now. This could be a time you stood up for someone else um, when they were being bullied, you know, in the second grade. Could be when you left a relationship that wasn't good for you, when you advocated for more treatment or some sort of change in your life. And I want you to take as many, I, I want you to take a moment and write down as many as you can think of. And remember that they don't have to be times that ended the way we wanted them to. Recognizing our power, using our power doesn't mean, and I got what I wanted. It could be like, I advocated for a need and it did not happen. That advocacy is still a time that we used our power and that's still important to recognize. So take a moment and, and write down just a little list of that. Next, I want you to create a list of times that you want to be able to embrace your power, recognizing your power. Could be starting a conversation with someone you've been fearful of, could be making a change in your work or home life um, to better accommodate needs, could be just asking for a need met. So we've got one time where we did use our power, we can recognize that, and situations where we want to be able to use our power or embrace our power.
So as you're working on this, and again, I encourage you guys to continue doing this, um, continue working on it because we're just giving you literally some moments. Um, I want you to look at the two lists and think about how the experiences you've already had using your power or embracing your power could be applied to the areas you want to be using and embracing your power. Hopefully you're going to find that some of the places you've already embraced power to impact those relationships um, can be translated to the places we want to. So thinking also about, okay, if there are areas where I don't feel like it translates, what would need to happen to feel like I could embrace my power in this situation? Is it that I need to figure out if these are safe people? Is it that I need to set smaller goals to kind of work up to it? Because it's kind of a big embracing of power. Um, but taking these lists, I encourage you all to take these lists, um, keep working on them, maybe take them to a therapy session later this week or next week um, and start to think about like, what are the ways you can acknowledge and embrace your power? Here's the here's the part we've kind of continually talked about, though. Not everyone is always going to respect our power. So we've talked a lot about getting in touch with it. How can we embrace it? How can we create a culture and society around us that's supportive? But the reality is we are still going to find ourselves at times in situations where our power isn't being respected. And in these situations, it's important to take a few steps. And the first is to look at the relationship dynamics. So like I said before, there are some hierarchical work role relationships that are clearly defined as non-mutual and do not invite that the ability for that authentic connection, that mutuality. These, this means that this cannot be a place that we are looking for our, our power to be kind of noticed and respected and, and reinforced. It doesn't mean we don't have power in those situations. It just means like we need to recognize that this is a place where it likely won't be recognized. We need to be able to differentiate because we need to be more self-protective and strategic in some of these situations and then learn where, where can we expect more openness, more authenticity, more growth fostering and mutuality because Trying that in a situation where it's not going to be respected is not going to help our ability to embrace our power. So asking yourself, what are the roles at play in this relationship? Is this a relationship that feels safe to be more open or is it one that was clear about the level of openness needed or allowed? Um, then we're going to kind of from answering those questions and probably some more, <laughs> look at our next step of, is this a situ situation where I simply let it lie, kind of let it be and say, okay, this is what I've got going on, or is this a place where I can be advocating for change? So next step would be advocating for change in, in one of two ways. It could be personally advocating for change by trying to find a situation where the power dynamics are not so strict, where openness is encouraged, or it could be for advocating for change in the relationship itself, if it feels safe to do so. Acknowledging a disconnection in a relationship around power dynamics in a, when it's a safe relationship um, can result in new, stronger connections when there is responsiveness, respect, and a mutual desire to understand and grow from the experience. For instance, if it's someone's hurt, um, like, but is, they're hurt emotionally in the relationship, but they're able to represent their feelings in the relationship and the other person responds and, and emphatically um, and empathetically and is moved by the distress of the injured person. The hurt person learns that they can have an impact on others and that they matter. And what we see is that our power is recognized and the relationship continues to grow from there. So we kind of depend, okay, is this a situation where I need, I can change, I can impact the relationship, or is it that I need to personally maybe leave the relationship? Um, so the last step is going to be most useful when it is a situation that is um, not encouraging openness. We've attempted to advocate for change. We're still being faced with the same power over dynamics. It then becomes on us to try and find ways that feel we feel empowered and 
it could be through leaving the situation, starting new on our own, creating experiences that support our power. It could also be done within the relationship we have by finding ways to still recognize our own power, even when someone has power over us. It can be small things, but like noticing little ways we're impacting each other's, like a coworker saying, hey, I really missed you yesterday. Like recognizing, oh, like my absence did impact someone in my presence today. Um, does. So even when we're in those situations that we can't change and maybe we can't get out of it for whatever reason, still noticing what are the ways I am still impacting people. So how do I hold on to my power? Let's find spaces that support our power. Don't be shy. Don't be shy in showing your power and be thoughtful about your environment. So finding places and spaces that are allowing you to be genuine and authentic and talk about your needs and have them met and advocated. Not feeling like I've got to be quiet and say like, oh, I, I need to make myself small to make this person feel OK. And being thoughtful about your environment. So what social, like cultural places am I putting myself in and how am I um, how is how are those impacting me and my ability to be genuine and authentic and be present? How do we continue exploring our power? Okay, I kind of have a good sense of it. What do I do now? Try new things. Um, so trying new things is a great way to imp like work on increasing our power because it is really about increasing that self-esteem by doing something new, doing something different and allowing ourselves to not be good at it and improve. So trying new things allows us to open up new areas of power that we can feel. Diversifying, um, not talking about finances here, but diversifying like our, our friend groups, our experiences, making sure that, you know, we have people that have power in different ways in our, in our immediate culture in our immediate group um, because that means we're going to be able to learn more we're going to be able to feel more we're going to be able to recognize power in different ways and by creating change whether it is you know advocating at your school or workplace um, writing a letter doing something like that but these are all ways we can continue exploring our power and how we can impact people so what about this week? You know, we talked about this as powering up for eating disorders awareness week. Um, so specifically during this week, creating change and advocating um, by using your power is a great way to continue exploring your power and also get other people to explore their power. It'll be a little bit more multiplied because there are so many people that are going to be focusing um, on eating disorders awareness week. So social media can be an amazing tool, help increase awareness, help get the word out about the importance of everyone understanding what is an eating disorder, how does this impact. You could um, National Eating Disorder Awareness Says website, so Nita's website has graphics you can share. Renfru has the hashtag. Renfrew has the power. There's also the hashtag EDA week 2023. All of these are ways that you could um, post something to get the word out. Maybe it's posting about your own recovery story or something that's impacted you. Um, start a conversation. So have a conversation with the people in um, your immediate social circle, if it feels safe, about diet culture, fat phobia, experiences we've had. Write a letter to a group or an organization to feel, um, to encourage them to change the way their practices um, might be impacting people. And try joining a group. So finding some sort of advocacy group um, around you that will help really increase that power and allow you to feel and be present with those feelings. Um, and that supports your kind of value-driven life and your power. So why is power important in recovery? Why did we even pick this topic, all of that? Um, 
using your powers is actually a really important piece of recovery because it's part, it's being part of the eating disorder recovery community. Um, that means in some ways we're part of a marginalized group. There is not significant or effective education around eating disorders in most levels of education, including medical school. Um, so nurses, doctors, even counselors um, don't always have a ton of education in it prior to actually working in the field. Um, it's important that we encourage others to educate themselves on how eating disorders really function as a tool of emotion avoidance. Um, and it allows them to learn, not only create more supports for us in our recovery, um, but also helps us to really change some of the beliefs that our society is holding. Because diet culture is also a part of, kind of a normalized part of our society at this point in time. You know, we see calories on menus, we see the labeling of food, like even very young in people's lives. And using our power to help others understand how harmful this can be, not only to someone struggling with an eating disorder or disordered eating, but just the general population as well, is something only those of us who have learned how harmful it can be can do. So it's a power like we kind of have that no one else does. Having conversations um, around allowing all foods to exist without moral labels and to understand that nourishing our bodies is about more than just caloric levels are ways that we can start to use our power to create change in the world. And using our power can also be an antidote to those times that we are keenly aware of our marginalized status recognizing that even with that SAS, we still have the power to impact others. We have the right and will allow us to continue to be with our experiences as opposed to feeling like we have to run away from them is really that sense of power that we want to get where it's, I can be present with my experiences. I can be present with my emotions. Um, and that's a, a major way to have power. And that is our Powering Up for Eating Disorders Awareness Week. So we will see if there are any questions. I know I went a little long, so. That is a-okay, Erin. Thank you so much. This has just been so wonderful. And I think we may have time for, for one question or so. And um, I would love to hear from you any of the ways that you've seen acknowledging your own power impact your relationships and life. Yeah, um, I love that question because um, I think it is, it's really cool to notice those ways, acknowledging power. Um, like I said, like most people don't have awareness of, you know, diet culture and fat phobia and things like that. It's, it's getting a little bit more out there. Um, but when I started working with this population 10 years ago, wasn't a, a huge point of discussion. Um, so I think it's been really cool. Um, noticing the power I've had in being able to educate like friends, especially around these ideas of all foods fit, um, around these ideas of, you know, health and weight not being, you know, causal factors and not even really being that connected. Um, and it's been really cool to watch some of my friends like correct other people when they have diet talk <laughs> from things I started talking to them about like 10 years ago um, and watching them, especially like my friends with kids now and like how they talk with their kids about food um, and being able to see like, wow, like, okay, those comments I was making eight years ago that were really annoying all of them, like now have created this change um, and they really have started to create change in bigger and different ways also on their own. That's so awesome. I love that. And I also just did want to share a comment from um, one of our alumni too that said, I really like this idea of using the lens of relationships to view ourselves kind of sounds like another form of reappraisal. Instead of reappraising things that are happening or what things that others are doing, we are reappraising our own behaviors and motivations. Um, so I just wanted to share that with you all too. I thought that was great. 
So we are at about the top of the, uh, the hour, so we will be winding down. I want to thank you all so much for joining us, and thank you so much, Erin, for just sharing your expertise with us today. We really, really appreciate it. And on behalf of myself, Erin, and the Renfrew Center Foundation, thank you all for participating, and we hope you have a wonderful day and a meaningful Eating Disorders Awareness Week as well. Take care, everyone. Thank you.